first slide. So you can see that, yeah? Yeah, all good. Here's one in the east. Okay, then. Now there's gonna be quite a lot of detail here. Don't, you know, just get, just get the general, general picture though, yeah? Uh, so let's go, right. So just picking up the story, um, disobedient Israel was scattered. In Deuteronomy, God said that, uh, I'll scatter you among all people, from one end of the earth, even to the other. And that there thou shalt serve other gods, which neither thy, uh, thou nor thy fathers have known, even wood and stone. Uh, and among these nations shall thou find no ease, uh, neither shall the sole of thy feet have rest, but the Lord shall give thee a trembling heart, a failing eyes, and sorrow of mind. So let's have a little look at their attitude that, that sent them into captivity. Uh, now, there was good King Hezekiah of Judah. He tries to help Israel in their, uh, in their last days. We can read about this in uh, Second Chronicles, about 726 BC. Some of them have already been taken off. And he says to them, look, be ye not stiff-necked as your fathers were, but yield yourselves unto the Lord, that the fierceness of his wrath may turn away from you um, and the posts which like um, like our letters, uh, passed from city to city through the country of Ephraim and Manasseh, even unto Zebulun, but they laughed them to scorn and mocked them. So they weren't in a repentant mood at, mood at all, even though, you know, um, some had already gone and that there's trouble at the gates. Um, <clears throat> yeah. And then Amos, it talks about, uh, chapter eight, it talks about my, the, my people of Israel, he is, O ye that swallow up the needy, that make the poor of the land to fail, saying, when will the new moon be gone that we may sell corn, and the Sabbath that we may set forth wheat, making the ephah small and the shekel great, and falsifying the balances of deceit, that we may buy the poor for silver and the needy for a pair of shoes, yea, and sell the refuse of the wheat. So, you know, as far as they were concerned, the things of God were just getting in the way. They didn't believe in God's way of doing things anymore, that if you do it God's way, you have the Sabbath, you give your, the best to the to the Levites and the priests so they can, you know, they can uh, minister the things of God. Um, they they decided, well, we can make it rich by ourselves. You know, God was basically shut out and he was just seen as, as, a, as a burden, an inconvenience. And uh, of course, many uh, think that way today. Um, so they, <clears throat> they thought they knew better than God. Um, more interested in getting rich through trade than blessed by God. Hosea says, Ephraim feedeth on wind and followeth after the east wind. Of course, well, they were trading a lot with the east and picking up their ideas and pleasing men. You know, let's, if we're going to do trade, well, we, we won't, we won't uh, talk about our God being better than your God or anything like that. We'll uh, just all compromise. Um, and daily increaseth lies and desolation. And they do make a covenant with the Assyrians, and oil is carried into Egypt. He is a merchant, the balances of deceit are in his hand. He loves to oppress or defraud. So, you know, they were sharp, a lot of sharp practice going on, get rich quick. Ephraim said, yeah, I'm become rich. I have found at me out substance. So, that, you know, they were looking, there was like a prosperity gospel going on. We, we found riches, surely, you know, what more do we need? Uh, in all my labours, they shall find none iniquity in me that was sin. They say, well, you know, I'm not sinning. I'm not doing anybody harm. Well, they were. They were cheating people and, and, and uh, just become completely uh, materially smart, but spiritually blind. That's, that's where they were at. And, of course, we can see a lot of similarities with people today. So it says he follows after the east wind. It's interesting that in Job 15, it says... Should a wise man utter vain knowledge and fill his belly with the east wind? He's not talking about facing east and taking a big sniff of breath. He's, the east wind is winds of doctrine. It, it's that the, the, the philosophy and religion from the east. And that's what they, they were following after, picking up all these other ideas, which sound very nice, talking about peace and all the rest of it. Uh, but um, it's all just 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 reliance on the flesh of man. Uh, and uh, I've just made a, an observation. Nothing has changed. Look at the modern Laodicean era, you know, that say I'm rich, I'm increased with good, I've need of nothing, can't see that they're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Got lots of big ideas and big talk, but it's all just uh, the Lord is not in it at all. Right. So Ezekiel, uh, he was in Babylon. Uh, 140 years uh, after Israel went into captivity, and he's um, he's there with the, the Jews, 
and uh, says, I was among the captives by the river Sheba. And he gets this message, son of man, go get thee to the house of Israel. Um, they won't hearken unto thee. They are impudent and hard hearted. So although he was with the, uh, the house of Judah that were taken captive to, to Babylon, he was also ministering to the house of Israel, who were many of whom were, you know, in that area as well to the north and, and the west and the south of it. Uh, so he's, God is saying to them, they're impudent and hard hearted. So they won't change. You know, so the description is accurate of how they would remain. So the re things we're going to read about, you know, is how the, what they became like. Uh, yeah. So um, what have I got here? Ezekiel 7 says, um, they shall gird themselves with sackcloth and horror shall cover them and shame shall be upon all faces, baldness upon their heads. They shall seek a vision of the prophet. Uh, but the law shall perish from the priest and counsels from the ancients. So it talks there about sackcloth and baldness and uh, always looking for a, a vision, um, but not finding it. Um, Amos also says a similar thing. Lord God showed me unto me a basket of summer fruit. So the summer fruit is like the end of the year, you know, uh, and basically talking about the end of Israel. And the Lord said to me, the end has come upon my people of Israel. I will not again pass by them anymore. I will turn your feasts into mourning and your songs into lamentation. I will put sackcloth upon thy loins and baldness upon thy head. And Ezekiel continues, I'll send famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst of water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. So, you know, they, they wouldn't know what, what God was saying anymore. Uh, it says, thou hast also taken my fair jewels of gold and silver, which I gave thee and made themselves images of men and discommit and and with them. So all these little clues talk about um, what, how we could, uh, what they get, what they get into. Um, now, could it be this? You know, we see all the all the things that were mentioned um, are found in Buddhism. So let's have a little look. Buddhism originated in modern day Nepal or northern India, sometime between the fifth and sixth centuries BC which is the right sort of time. Its originator was named Sakyamuni, which means sage of the Sakas, or a prince of the Sakans. Now we remember the prophecy in Isaac, shall they see be called. And now we've got the, uh, the Behistun rock there inscription, which equates the Sakai with the, the Gimri, which is the house of Omri, which is the house of Israel. So the Sakai uh, um, are Israelites. So this guy was of the Sakai. So, so there's some strong clues. Um, okay, so this guy, let's have a little look at him, Sakyamuni. You get all this from, from uh, face, um, uh, Wikipedia. Born about six, five, six, three BC, although not exactly sure. At an early age, he'd risen to be a prince of the surrounding peoples. The indigenous people said that Buddha was of the Kshatira, which, uh, which is a royal clan of the powerful Sakas popularly known as the Ashvakas because they uh, bred and trained war horses and cattle and provided expert ca uh, cavalry service. And it's also known as the Cambojas because they came from a region to the north. So that all fits as well. He preached for 40 years about charity and chastity and overturned many tyrannies. So they were a big powerful people. Um, they, they were on, you know, riding around on the steps and, and they were growing and multiplying. Um, and he declared equality between high and low castes. He founded hospitals and raised women to equality. Um, he, taught the com he taught that the coming of a seed of a woman of the Sakyans would crush the serpent's head and bring peace to the world. So he, he was preaching something which we get from the Old Testament. Uh, after his death, idolatry and innovations crept in. So he, he probably had, meant well and had some good ideas, um, but to, uh, things change after people die. So here's some other evidences. Um, Buddhism introduced animal motifs to India derived from the steppe peoples. The stag or deer, which was a symbol of Buddha's first sermon in the deer park, horses, eagles and winged lions were also, also used. So these are all indications that these, these people uh, were from that area um, where you know, many of the Israelites became these you know, known as Scythians and Sakans. And they, 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 uh, they roamed and uh, you know, reared horses and things like that. 
Now there's an indigenous guy there mentioned, Lord of the Animals, and his seal shows rhino, tiger, water buffalo, and ibex, which are the sort of animals you get in India. So it's, it, it was a different, somebody new. Uh, the Buddhist ideal of a wheel turning, world conquering monarch to which kings aspired, which was a, a concept borrowed from the steppe peoples who were quite familiar with wheels and wagons. Um, the cremation of bodies and the erection of stupas or burial mounds used for meditation, previously unknown in India, but common amongst these Scythians, where they were, we still see them today in around the deads of the, um, the Black Sea, they're known as Kurgans and they find lots of treasures there and burial stuff. So they brought that with them as well. Uh, one of the 32 marks of the Buddha was that he had blue eyes, indicating that he was Iranian or Caucasian. And then in the Dinga Nikaya, which is a Buddhist scripture, it tells the story of Buddha's people, the uh, Sakyas and Scythians. So it actually says in their scripture that's, that's his original people as being foreign. And when a native Indian disciple named Ambatha visits uh, their city, uh, Buddha's hometown, he complains that they sat upon high seats in meeting halls, engaging in laughing, rough play, poking each other's fists and fingers, and paid no regard to him. Um, and then another point is that he rejected the caste system. So they were like a foreign people, and all the signs are they were the, the, the Israelites. Um, and the more we look at the prophecies in Ezekiel 8 and 16 and Amos, uh, all the things that, that were said about what they would do uh, were done by these people. Uh, so another tradition is the uh, attaching, why have I got that there? Hang on a bit. Attaching colorful prayer ribbons and flags to trees on hills. You might've seen this. The idea is you, 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 plant, you write your tree on, on a, you write your prayer on a colorful piece of cloth or, or piece of paper and leave it open to the elements. And when it dis disintegrates, your prayer is answered and heard. That's their thinking. Um, and Ezekiel says, of thy garments thou didst take and decked thy high places with diverse colours and played the harlot thereupon. So it's, you know, it's just blind faith in, oh, well, you know, it's like people will have a rabbit's foot or uh, something like that. You know, it, it just they're not actually expecting God to keep his word. It's just they got the prayer request and whatever the wind does, whichever way the wind blows and however long it takes. Um, Another one is my meat, which I gave thee, fine flour and oil and honey, wherewith I fed thee. Thou hast even set it before them, which means they're false gods, as a sweet savour. And there we here we see uh, tormas, which are figures made mostly of flour and butter and used in tantric rituals and offerings to, um, hang on a second, to I'm missing the bottom. Oh, Tibetan Buddhism, All right. Uh, Buddha, Buddha eventually dies, and Amos says, I will make it as the morning of an only son, and the end thereof as a bitter day. Uh, and there's, there's a, um, uh, obviously there are many uh, statues they find in burial areas and where they record quite accurately what they look like, these people. And to me, they look like Westerners, you know, the same type of people as what became Anglos, Saxons years later. Um, and Central Asian funerary customs included pulling of hair and cutting faces, believed to bring about resurrection. Uh, Rahula, the only son of Buddha, and his wife, Princess uh, Yosodhara, died before him. So when they died, they were looking to this guy. Um, of course, it's a great sorrow. You know, he didn't rise from the dead. Um, you know, it's like they put their hope in this guy, and it's like mourning for an only son in a bitter day. Uh, where does the idea of the name Buddha come from? It means separated branches. You can find it in the Hebrew. For they are gone up as to Syria as a wild ass alone by himself. And the Hebrew word is Badad. Uh, and if you look at this map, it's got a bunch of different um, Scythian uh, uh, tribes. And up the top, uh, top right there is the Budni, um, or the Buddha, otherwise known as the Budai. Ezekiel, the priest, was the son of Buzai. So not exactly sure where the term Buddha, Buddhism came from, but there's all these uh, relevant things. Um, Herodotus lists the names of six meat tribes or castes. Uh, you know, they, they were trans, they were escorted, weren't they, to, to media. Uh, the Buddha I found also along the Black Sea Scythians as Budni. Uh, Buddha was the uh, 
the Saka or East Scythian form of the name. So if you translate that this 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 name you know, for a, uh, an Israelite tribe, uh, Budai or Budli, it becomes Buddha when you go east. The way they pronounce pronounce things. Um, now look at the uh, I've got bits floating on my screen here. Look at the temple. Um, they, he says Ezekiel says I brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house. Behold, the door of the temple of the Lord between the porch and the altar were about five and twenty men. God's giving him visions and, and insight into what, what was going on with the corruption um, with their backs towards the temple of the Lord and their faces toward the east and they worshipped the sun towards the east so in their heart they were already before they even left Israel you know they were all, already going looking at, at the world and, and the eastern uh, ideas and, and all the treasures that they could have out there and the Lord was become, was already being forgotten so it's interesting that it's 25 because that would they'd be priests because they you might in the old testament if you read it in one chronicles 24 there were 24 courses of priests and then the, the high priest makes 25 so they were all the whole lot were getting corrupted uh by this uh, and we, you know if we look at uh, modern so-called christianity you know the whole system is uh is looking in the wrong direction individuals might be seeking the Lord, but generally, you know, the whole thing is, is already looking to the flesh and the world. They are of the world, therefore the world hears them, it says in John. Ezekiel 1, 11, verse 1, sorry, it says, that, uh, the Lord, moreover, the Spirit lifted me up and brought me into the east gate of the Lord's house, which looks eastward, and behold the door of the gate, five and twenty men, uh, princes of the people. So the prince is there, you know, uh, getting it, uh, involved. So uh, this number 25, coincidentally in Buddhism, they have... Um, 25 uh, beautiful mental mental factors uh, in meditation um, and they've got these these holy bodhis, bodhisattvas which are buddhist disciples and they reveal their scriptural passages which all seem very noble but without the spirit of god it's just weak humanism you know it's like a lot of other religions catholicism you know they will recant various prayers and thoughts um uh, but it's all of you know without the spirit of god it's all just uh the, the best positive thinking so here we have in modern vietnam um you can see those 25 there and there's in 10th century sri lanka there's a a, a carving on a wall uh the um particular sort of bodhisattva which is like a saint really but a patron saint of compassion so all the same kind of ideas we see in other religions were, were being brought in. Back to Ezekiel, his vision of God as wheels is seen in Eastern religion. He had a vision of, of wheels, you know, this is what being, he was obviously, that was obviously well known because he, he gave that vision, God gave that vision and it was well promoted uh, of that, you know, the wheels. And they've got this thing called the wheel of Dharma. You can see it on the Indian flag and various statues. It has 24 spokes um you know like that israel had 24 um, courses of priests um lions are also seen in the heraldry of tibet and china and singapore which actually means lion city um the national emblem of india you can see it kind of round the, the bottom of the, the lions there dating back to 250 bc you've got the four lions and you've got four creatures below remember israel also had four living creatures they've got an elephant a bull for the west a horse for the south and a lion to the north. So Israel's were a lion to the east, a bull to the west, a man to the south, and an eagle to the north. Um, so these people that, that came down to India, history shows they introduced much new technology. They built cities in northern India, and they were seen as white gods. Uh, the sacred language of Buddhism is called the language of the Mags or Magi by neighboring nations. Uh, Magi was um, obviously their, their priestly people, um, and Mara is their evil one, and Mara means bitter in Hebrew. <clears throat> so, going forward in 88 BC, the, uh, so it's like the first century BC, shortly before Christ, the Indo Scythians, or the, you know, the Scythians that went to India, also called the Indo Sakas, set up a great kingdom in India under the great king of kings called Maus or Mauses which is pretty similar to Moses. Uh, you can see a map there. Um, 
Sigal in Sakastan, uh, you know, where did that name come from? Uh, where they spread from is the royal city of the Sakas. Uh, the Sakas and Pahlavas or Parthians uh, were allies during this migration. Parthians and Concilians considered themselves brothers and for so they were. So they started going down on and, and uh, setting up uh, nations in, in, uh, in India. Have a little look at what they look like. There's a, a Scythian music boy band. Uh, you can find that in Pakistan. Um, and there is what's called a lion capital from Mathura, India, from the first century AD. It's now in the British Museum. It records gifts of a Buddha statue and a stupa, which is a burial place and prayer meditation place, from Indo Scythian royalty, confirming their involvement. Uh, from the 5th century BC, these, this tribe that Buddha came from helped form a military confederation with the uh, Yaudhaya, which is a derivative word of Yuda or Yoda, uh, meaning warriors. It's where obviously they get it from in, in Star Wars. Um, and it, that is the Sanskrit for Judea. Um, so showing they were getting involved with, with each other. And they had a king's titled Gondo Fares, which means the Great Fares which was obviously Judah's sons were Fares and, and Zara. And Wiki reports that um, this Gondo Fares is otherwise known as Gaspar the first. And, you know, We Three Kings hymn talks about that name in Western language and is recorded one of the wise men that came to seek the baby Jesus. Uh, they were known as Indo-Parthian and the Parthian nobility had seven houses. Coincidentally, Judah had seven sons. And if you look at the arms there of this, this dynasty, it's pretty similar to Israel stuff. You've got the lions and the lion on top. Um, it's some kind of ta ancient Tamil writing. I tried to find out what that inscription means. And pe people say, yeah, this is stuff that hasn't been spoken for 100 years. So I've yet to get the answer what it actually says. Um, but it's got a lot of symbolism there we recognize. And there are they, there they are up there in Northwest India. Uh, yeah. There's a few more um, statues of them showing what they look like. So now we're going to have part two. So they're spread beyond India. They became Silk Road traders. There's there's the various Silk Road uh, 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 trade routes. I'm just going to get out of the way. Uh, so um, let's have a look at that. So from um, the Babylons were overtaken by the Medo-Persians, were overtaken by the Greeks, and the Parthians rose up um, about you know, 200 BC, ruled by the House of Judah, they took control, um, and they were the first people listed in Jerusalem at Pe uh, Pentecost, showing that they were you know, still Jews. Um, and the Sacrosidians were many tribes, um, and they're already free Israelites. You see, you know, this is well, well known, this sort of map. So they were in that, that region and, and, and wanting to trade and move and grow. Um, one of the biggest tribes are known as the Masagete, which means the great people of God. Um, and obviously God had, had said that to Abraham that their descendants were to become a great nation and a great company of nations. And we, we obviously see a fulfillment of that in the modern day, but you know, it, it was already it was already fulfillment in these centuries you know in the, the dark times the missing years between sort of 700 bc and 400 ad when they kind of appeared in europe you know so god was still work, keeping his word uh, and they could still be found and proved so chinese documents about 123 bc speak of the uh, the yuzi named after their first major ruler yithao or hiftao uh, they were forced out of Western China and settled what were now Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan. Uh, they were later called the Tokarians. And new finds of mummies are forcing a re-examination of old Chinese book, books that describe historical or legendary figures of great heights with deep-set blue or green eyes, long noses, full beards with red or blonde hair. Scholars have traditionally scoffed at these accounts, you know, which were written by the Chinese, but when they found the mummies, they said, ah, actually they were right. This is what, you know, this is what these people look like. Um, now it seems they might be accurate. The textiles are strikingly similar to those of the Celts from 800 BC onwards. So another indicating that they were from the same stock. The Celts obviously went west. Uh, they've got interwoven, including uh, woven twill, 
and tartan patterns. <coughs> um, tartan is, is like the Hebrew word embroidered. So um, in Ezekiel 28, it says, thou shalt embroider or interweave color threads in squares, a coat of fine linen and judges. It says that Caesarea, Caesarea uh, came for a prey uh, of diverse colors, a prey of um, diverse colors and needle work on both sides, meet for the necks of them that take the spot. So these were sought after the, uh, he wanted to get hold of the Israelite clothing. It was, wasn't, you know, it was good stuff. Uh, as we can see, you can see the quality there. Um, so these Tokarian were known as donors or financiers on another painting. One, the one in green is seen performing uh, a Buddhist discussion gesture with that, that hand symbol. Wikipedia reports that Parthians and Tokarians had a major influence on Buddhism's uh, spread. So um, just a suggestion, where does the name, to because I don't know where, why were they called Tokari? Um, the prefix to from Tola and the, and the suffix car from Issachar, one of the sons of Issachar uh, after his families of Tola, Numbers 26. And uh, prophecy of Issachar is a strong ass couching between two burdens, rejoice in thy tents. So if you put those things together, you know, he's, he's like a strong uh, ass or donkey with, with full of burden, full of carrying lots of stuff in, in tents so he's like you know that would fit him being a trader which is what they were doing um, first century ad so the, there's chinese pressure that pushes them west and there's the rise of what's known as the kushan empire um, chinese sources on western tribes they traded with this is what this is how they, they describe these people their customs are generally similar uh, and their language is mutually intelligible. The, the men have deep set eyes and profuse beards and whiskers. They are skillful at commerce and will haggle over a fraction of a cent. Women are held in great respect and the men make decisions on the advice of their women. It's people cultivate the land and have cities and houses. Uh, uh, there's no great ruler, but only a number of petty chiefs uh, ruling the various cities. The people uh, are poor in the use of arms and afraid of battle but they are clever at commerce. So um, yeah, that's what they were into. And here's another picture of what they looked like. This is just for, for background information. I'll come back to some more scriptures in a minute. Um, there they are some more of them with, um, with Buddha's mother. An inscription reads, it was Kanishka the Great who discontinued the Greek language and then placed the Aryan language now, Aryan was the, the, the Parthian name for, for Iran. So um, Arya also means to assemble skillfully and the root of our word aristocracy. So um, yeah, they sort of translated into Parthian words, use Greek letters. Um, and we can see them there wearing Greek togas and things. Um, so you can see how the cultures mixed together. Um, and he was called, so I guess, the King of Kings um, on his coin there, and the, the Buddha on the reverse. Uh, so um, <clears throat> by doing away with the Hindu caste system, it allowed social mobility and it put business first, uh, which is what people wanted. So monks ran what we basically call hotels along these trade routes. Uh, uh, you know, funded by donations from the merchants. So, you know, a lot of um, money got involved with the, the, the development and spread. You know, you, you pay us and then we'll um, put you up and bless you. Uh, merchants found that the moral and ethical teachings of Buddhism to be an appealing alternative to previous religions. As a result, merchants supported Buddhist monasteries along the Silk Roads and in return, uh, the Buddhists gave the merchants somewhere to stay as they traveled from city to city. And then we see some, you know, uh, a carving of, uh, of Buddhist uh, merchants on a Buddhist temple in Indonesia. It tells the story of Buddhism in stone. And this northern gateway of the Sanchi Stupia, Stupa in India shows all these different people there. They're all foreigners coming to worship and trade. We can see this, these guys in the bottom left, that, that's called, called a conics, they're kids. And you've got Greeks there. So people were, there was international trade. People were coming from far in the West and far in the East. Um, so we can see it was a huge, it was a huge distraction, you know, and uh, 
that's 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 what they were into you know sharing their ideas and all their goods and services and uh, um, buddhism was there to facilitate so here's a map um <clears throat> uh, showing it's starting there in you know, just above india spreading all over the, all over the place to down to indonesia across to japan korea china uh, cambodia sri lanka uh, inscriptions on monasteries tell huge amounts of gold and money being deposited to be loaned at interest so really they acted more like banks um, you know this is actually on the inscriptions so you know <laughs> we can see what they were about the wealth allowed the monks to travel far and wide building temples so if you know you know how they supported themselves they were supported very well thank you yeah um these are known as the Bamiyan Buddhas of Afghanistan. You can just about see them in the in the carved into the rock there. Do you remember there was prophecy about worshiping wood and stone and images of men? They've still got them, although the um, who were those guys that, uh, that rose up and, and blew up a lot of these things? I, I forget them now. Um, so anyway, but then, until recently, there were a lot lots of them there. That's an artist impression. They were originally been painted. Uh, in bright colours. Om, Om Mani Pominum. Who remembers that from uh, from some um, Doctor Who or something? <coughs> om or Om is the most common mantra word, and is supposedly the sound, the background sound of the universe. Uh, it's used on its own or in mantras such as Om Mani Pominum. Now, Amos says. Uh, that scattered Israel shall be on the mountains like doves uh, of the valleys, all of them mourning. So there be, Gamer says, you'll go up to the mountains and you'll make these sort of um, dove-like noises. And the Hebrew word is um, for that is more uh, or more, which is onomatopoeic. The word sounds like the sound, uh, which is, you know, again, pretty accurate. And they've actually found, been up the mountains and found uh, carved stones, money stones, they call it, each with or money pominum on a mountain pathway. So they go up to the mountains and think they get in touch with God or nature by chanting these things. And of course, it's, it still happens today, pretty common. Um, and you know, the various hand gestures there. Um, and they also have the teaching of women not entering the temple. Uh, during their uh, period and that's copied so you know they copied some ideas from god um here's another whoops i need to go back there it is Phew. amos says they shall wander from sea to sea and from the north even to the east they shall run to and fro and seek the word of the lord and shall not find it in that day shall their fair virgins and their young men faint for thirst now you can look at it literally but more or less people say uh, and people that have looked into what that means it, it's talking uh, like spiritually or because they take vows of celibacy and um, you know they get this idea of forbidding to marry and think that it's more holy and um, you know and they they uh, you know it, uh, it's like doing without unnecessarily so you know it's privations thinking that uh you know stoic sort of idea i give up this for god um it's not the grace of god though really it's, uh, it's, it's, it's taking away the grace of god so that that is again fulfilled um buddhism spread east along the silk road uh, to china and beyond which is what amos said would happen it says they also swear by the sin of samaria and the sin of samaria was to obviously to make the the, the calf god Jeroboam made two calves of gold and you know the, the cow is a very sacred uh, creature in uh, Buddhism. Thy calf of Samaria has cast thee off. The workman made it and therefore it is not God but the calf of Samaria shall be broken in pieces. So it just shows you know they, they, they got the same wrong holy cow idea. Not all bad news. I'll take a breath. Um, as you know, there are there are going to be a few good apples, a few people that actually tried to keep and spread God's ways. Isaiah prophesies, um, they shall not hunger nor thirst, neither shall the heat nor sun smite them, for he shall have mercy on them, shall lead them, 
even by the springs of water he shall guide them i will make all my mountains away and my highways shall be exalted behold these shall come from afar and lo, these from the north and from the west and from the land of sinim now the land of sinim is China or at least Western China. We still today talk about Sino-Soviet relations. Here's Ptolemy's map in the second century AD. You can just about see it to the sort of top right there, Sine, uh, and uh, <clears throat> there are other other thing, proofs that um, the, you know they're coming from the, the so you know these come from the north, the west, and the land of Sim. So it's either going to be the east or the south. And uh, you know, I believe it's uh, the land of Sinim is is China. So you know, they they went that way. Um, there is a, a Chiang or Quang or Changming tribe, which have ancient Israeli customs. Uh, they have they believe in one God. They have an oral tradition. It came from the far west. They say their ancestor had twelve sons. They have customs of Passover, purification, leveret marriage, which was something in the Old Testament. If a man uh, uh, died, then his brother would take up his wife. So they've got that tradition. Uh, and in Japan, um, there's a large Shinto shrine every 15th of April, which is Passover. The most important festival takes place, uh, or it did until about 1900. Um, a boy is tied to a rope on a wooden pillar and placed on a bamboo carpet. A Shinto priest can, comes um, uh, to him preparing a knife and cuts a part of the top of the wooden pillar. Uh, then a messenger or another priest comes and the boy is released. Uh, now, obviously, that reminds us of uh, uh, Abraham offering Isaac. <clears throat> People call this the festival of Misachi, sorry, Misakuchi God. Misakuchi might be Mi Isakuchi which means great Isaku, or the most likely Isaac. It is hosted by the Mor Moriah family since ancient time. Moriah is strangely similar to Moriah, obviously, which is the mountain where Isaac offered, uh, Abraham offered Isaac. Uh, um, uh, Moriah no Kami is the god of Moriah, is their ancestor's god. And look at these Shinto priests there, and I'm going to show you a little video, actually. Um, they're carrying something you know, which is on poles. Um, instead of cherubim, there's an imaginary gold bird and a mysterious heavenly being. Uh, now, if I can hopefully switch to that, we'll just have a little video incident. They still, they still have it, it today. And here's a little video. <laughs> Uh, Nick, we can't see that, we can't hear it. Right, so various people we, we, we couldn't see that, we can only hear it. Ah, right. Yeah. Um, you might have um, to share. Um, um, you, you might have to share, um, maybe that particular video. Maybe, maybe you only share the slideshow only, not the, not the um, monitor. How do I share the video? Sorry. If you go to share the screen again. It says you are screen sharing. Yeah, you might have to close that that, um, that, that screen and then share again from scratch. So at the top, you should have a red button saying stop screen share. Yeah. And then share screen again, and you should see the option for um, the video or maybe screen two or screen one to share. Can you see it now? Uh, no, no. Yeah. You can't see that, no? No. Um, if you share screen again. 
All right, yeah. And maybe choose um, the screen instead of the particular app. You're not seeing it, are you? No, no. Nah. You can, I'll tell you what, Nick, you can share it with me later. So it basically shows them carrying something that looks like the Ark of the Covenant. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Uh, and various quotes about it. Okay. All right. Um, let me just get back to it then. Uh, can, share screen? can you can you see that? No, no, you have to share no, screen no, again. No, 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 no. If you go back to Zoom, you should go to the bottom of the green, the green share screen button. Yeah. And if you click on it, you should have some choices there. One participant can share at a time. Advanced sharing options. I'm clicking on the green button, but it's not doing anything, is it? No. Is, is the PowerPoint to open on your PC? Yeah. But you can't see it, can you? Uh, oh, there we go. Oh, that's me. That's me. I'm clicking on the share screen, but is it opening up in the background? Maybe there should be like another window that that opens. It might be open in the background. The option something. It's giving me multiple participants can share simultaneously and advanced sharing options. Host, I'm the host, yeah. Yep, yeah. Uh, co host, yeah. Co host. Oh, yeah, yeah, he's co host. I don't understand. Uh, Is there many slides left, Nick? Uh, yeah, I would, would like to finish you off. Um, well, we could always do a part two if you wanted. Yeah. If, what, if I log out and log in again? Uh, um, yeah, you should try that, sorry. <laughs> I'll do that then, yeah? Yeah. Hello? Yeah. Oh, uh, it's very similar to the Old Testament. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, right, I'll go back to the PowerPoint, which uh, slideshow, well, I'm going to have to go through a Right, this one. So, um, the guy called Yamabushi is a religious man in training today. A spirit. Morning. 
Sorry, Nick, you might need to kill that video if we can't see the slideshow anymore. Okay. Uh, yeah, if you share screen again and then. Okay. Yep, perfect. Yay. Right. Okay, so in today, a, a modern religious man in training is called a Yamabushi. A, a small black box is called a token on his forehead, uh, is uh, play, held with a black cord. Originally, the Jewish phylactery placed on the forehead seemed to have come from the forehead plate, inverted commas, that's how the, the Bible puts it, put on the high priest Aaron with a cord. We read about that in Ezekiel, uh, Exodus 28. It was about four centimetres. Some scholars maintain that it was flower shaped rather than box shaped. He also blows a horn. So there's all these other similarities. You can see there with, with tassels on, a, on this particular priest's uh, uh, garment made of linen. Uh, Buddhism in China, Korea and India had no such custom. So, you know, this, these things came before Buddhism got there. So, you know, God had his witnesses before they got there. Um, <clears throat> Japan didn't get to Japan until the 7th century AD. Uh, one of these holy men was legendary uh, uh, Tengu, who lived on a mountain, and he was uh, had a pronounced nose and supernatural capabilities, according to the legend. He, uh, a ninja, who was an agent or spy in the old days, while working for his lord, goes to this Tengu at the mountain to get from him supernatural abilities, and he gives him a Torah nomaki, which is a scroll of the Torah or a master scroll. After giving him additional powers, the scroll of the Torah is regarded as a very uh, important book, which is helpful for any crisis. The Japanese use the word sometimes in their current lives. So, um, Torah no maki. I mean, you can find it today in the um, uh, martial arts. It's, it, the word is similar to tiger, so it's a symbol of a tiger. And there are many other such sim uh, similarities, such as uh, shrine design, you can look at that and compare it with the Old Testament temple uh, dress and customs. <clears throat> Other peoples in this area, you've got the Benai Manash or the children of Manasta, known as the Xinglung in India. There's a community of people from various uh, Tibeto-Burmese ethnic groups in the border of India and Burma. You can see their, their symbol there with the Star of David. Afghanistan, you've got the uh, the Yasuf Zai tribe, or the children of Joseph, they have customs of the ancient Israelites. The Pashtuns, who are very well known, they're also in Pakistan. Uh, they have uh, customs of circumcision on the eighth day, fringes on their robe and the Sabbath, etc. The Kashmiri people, they have the uh, same names as were on the ancient uh, places, same land names as you find in Northern Kingdom of Israel. They have the Feast of Passover, and a legend that they came from Israel. And then you've got the Jats of Punjab and Northwest Frontier. They have uh, with this similar clan names and virtually identical with European names, for example, Jill, Man, Burke, Baines, Dylan, Mao or Moore, Lally, etc. All of these existed before the British imperial days of the 19th century. So it's in, uh, uh, Jat, JT, J hyphen T, like. Is similar to very similar to jutes, all thought to come from Judah. And you look at them, you know, they do have a Western look, a lot of these people. Jesus told his 12 disciples to go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So they obviously knew where to go. Um, and that would make the life a little bit easier for them because a lot of them were just simple guys, you know, they were fishermen. And it would overcome the language problem. So records say that Thomas and Bartholomew went to India and Greek historians record how Thomas also journeyed into North uh, West India where the so-called white Indians dwelt. These people were also known as the Ephthalite or Ephthalite Huns, which is a very similar word to Naphtali. Um, and there's um, Gondofaris receiving uh, a letter from St. Thomas and there's a, a, a bit of a map there got the Ephthalites and the White Huns uh, in northern India there. UNESCO 1996, writing on the Ephthalite Empire, says the etymology or the origin of the, the word Ephthalites is in the Tajik or Persian straw man. In Saka, a similar word exists, meaning brave or valiant. Now in Genesis, 
um, we see that, you know, the name is similar to the name Naphtali. Rachel said, with great wrestlings, I have wrestled with my sister and have prevailed. And she called his name Naphtali. So, you know, that's that's another sort of tie in. The names of Hephthalite rulers and their language are Iranian, which is, which is the area uh, Iran where, you know, where Parthia was and where a lot of them got involved. Uh, the origin of the word Han is unsure. Iranian Hunara means skill. In Turkic, it means 10. Uh, the Sassanids, so the ancestors of the modern Iranians, were effectively a vassal state paying these people tribute. So they're very strong people. Um, the, this Hephthalite Empire finally fell in 710 AD, or the 8th century, and they went west. Um, some, a lot of people say that they, be, they were known by among the, the Avars and modern day Hungary, where you've got Budapest. Um, but for those that wanted independence, um, Sweden was still available, obviously, because that coming in the eighth century, most of it is already settled. Now, it's a huge coincidence, but where did all the Vikings suddenly appear from? You know, the, the people say, all oh, the sudden uh, population explosion in Scandinavia, which isn't a, an area, it's a cold land, you know. Uh, and, there, and it wasn't just a population explosion, it was a cultural explosion as well. Well, you know, these, these um, Vikings, you know, they had a lot of technology. They, they were able to terrorize the rest of the, the world, really. So they weren't, were no mean people. You know, and they and we see they had a lot of um, Eastern symbols on their boats. They had a, a Buddha buckle from a Viking ship. You got this um, this swastika symbol, which obviously the Nazis nicked, but originally it came from the, the Far East and it, it meant health, luck, and success and prosperity. It's meant to symbolise going into the whole world. Uh, yeah, and another thing is the. the um, the Vikings, they, they had these strong little horses that they brought with them, like the Shetland ponies, and they, they brought them with them. They, they're very useful, and they can also be traced back to Mongolia. Uh, nearly finished, I, I looked into all this, and then I found this, this guy, George Moore, Reflections in 1861. He bought this, made this 400 page book. He went out there. And it says, um, the sections of the East and of the West, new views on Buddhism, translations of the rock records of India. So he went out and, and, and translated all the, you know, the inscriptions. And his conclusion, and I, you know, I've looked, read, skipped through his book, and he makes a lot of interesting little points. Uh, Sakya Buddha must have seemed like the promised Messiah, and he still does to many people, of course. During 40 years preaching, it over. And so many tyrannies, inculcated charity and chastity, but both had been unknown um, and declared perfect equality between high caste and low, founded hospitals for the halts, the blind and the destitute, placed a trained physician at stated intervals um, for the help of the afflicted along the highways who had sent out his missionaries, fired with his own zeal and enlightened with his intelligence to teach kindness everywhere and the performance of the thoughtful devotion and the means of delivering the soul from evil. So that's what they were, they were trying to promote. Um, man raised raise women to the right place at the side of the heart of man. So Buddha informed us that he at length obtained a knowledge of his wickedness and he abhorred himself. You know, they talk about Nirvana and things like that. But unhappily, together with this awful Job-like apprehension of the heinousness of sin. So he saw his own weakness as he tried to be holy. Uh, he does not, like Job, obtain a just conception of the divine character. He repents, indeed, in dust and ashes, uh, but he seems never to get out of the dust and ashes until his death. And that's that's the, the sad thing, you know, really, like a lot of these well-meaning religious people there, you know, getting, trying to get sin out of their life. I met some Buddhists and they say, you know, I've given up fornication, I've given up this. And, you know, they mean very well, um, but there's no real faith in a God that does anything. And so it's, you end up um, just well aware of your own weakness. Um, Buddhism today is practiced by 500 million people worldwide, only 250,000 in the UK, but it's the fastest growing religion, 600,000 in Australia, three and a half million in America.
Um, so Buddhism still teaches of a future Buddha who will appear on earth and achieve complete enlightenment. So they've still got this belief that, that someone's coming and teach what they call pure Dharma. His name is Maitreya, which means loving kindness. Now, we got news for them. Titus 3, verse 4 to 5. After the kindness and love of God our Saviour towards man appeared, not by works of righteousness that we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration, which means new beginning and renewing of the Holy Ghost. So we've got what they're looking for. Um, other world religions, for example, um, Islam talks about the coming Mahdi or the 12th Imam. Um, the, the Jews are still waiting for a Messiah. Taoism is looking for Li Hong. Um, Hinduism is looking for Kalki, the destroyer of darkness. And Zoroastrianism is looking for this guy called Soishansa, the man of peace. Um, so they're all hoping for some great person to come uh, but Haggai 2 verse 7 says I will shake all nations and the desire of all nations shall come so they're in a sense they're all right they're all correct there is a perfect one coming um, but it's given to us to show them well <laughs> you know um, you can know him now you know you can uh, you can discover this person now and you know he's coming in you know, to set up his kingdom um, but you know you're not left alone in the meantime. You know you, you, uh, he wants to pure, would be at work in us in the meantime. Uh, yeah. So I just it's, you know it's fascinating how you know pr privileged position we're in. You know these people are, 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 are trying hard a lot of them to escape their sin and their weakness, but we've got the answer that works. So that's uh, I'll call that a day. Amen. Hey, Amen. Amen. Amen.